you could see this afternoon, we started to talk about the work in higher education, so which is the actually current continuation of this work, a new strand of work, and where we try to combine, as we did in primary and secondary education um, development, but also a kind of evidence-informed ways of changing the system. We've been talking about this morning, you know, the challenge of sustainability and how we have to work with uh, uh, policymakers, and it was very nice to see how this was, in principle at least, you know, embraced by a lot of system leaders, you know, so there is change and how this can actually go into the curriculum. And so in this session, actually, we have uh, uh, two distinguished uh, researchers who are very much in favor of um, evidence-based or evidence-informed policy reform and policy change. Um, Barbara Schneider, who is a professor at Michigan State University and, you know, a great researcher in a lot of ways, very innovative and, and very doing a lot of intervention research, so that she is very experimental in that area. And Robbie Coleman, who is um, working at EEF, the Education Endowment Foundation, here in, we've heard about them yesterday already, uh, yes, yesterday morning, and actually who w have commissioned and working, spreading a lot of work around randomized control trials in England and with the focus of trying to um, um, reduce inequity in England. So that's one of the, the big target of, of the foundation. So we I'm going to invite Barbara and then Robbie to talk a bit about how can we actually nudge the system. That's, that's what we've called it in, in uh, um, the agenda. Knowing that you know, evidence is important, we know that sometimes when you have evidence, it doesn't necessarily mean that people will actually use it, spread it, uh, etc. And so, how what can we learn from these kind of studies, and what what can we do to actually make these approaches being more uh, embraced by different education systems? Thank you very much. Let me start by a few questions, and so that you can think of yours. I'm going to open the floor uh, very soon. One for Barbara, uh, which is, so what do you think will happen? Now you have the best FXIs you've ever had, so you have something that really works. And so do you think that people in Michigan or in the U.S. are going to save the, you know, the units that you've developed and, and to implement it? Or, so what do you see are the next steps uh, in your case? And let me ask one uh, to Robbie as well. So what would be a better word than, than nudging the system? And given you know, all the experience that you have in producing all this evidence, even what happened to, to them? You know? So that what, generally speaking, is it worse actually? You know? So currently we've developed an intervention that we have a tool that maybe we, you know, we're going to ask our country representatives and you know, friends, would you like to see how it works, for whom, et cetera? And is it, is it an investment that's worth doing at the end of the day if after that nothing happens? Well, um, the first thing that's happened is that um, all the school districts that we're currently working in have asked us to develop more units. Um, they would like to see it in biology. They want it in astrophysics. They want it to last the year because the teachers have been so supportive. Our, um, what we're doing this year um, typically doesn't usually happen, but we're doing it anyway, is we're giving the treatment to the control teachers from last year so that we can analyze to see did the control teachers have the same effect as the treatment teachers from year one. Do the treatment teachers from year one have the same sustained effect during um, the year two when they went to give it a second year? And then um, we'll use simulation designs to put together a control condition for the control group to see if, in fact, the control group looks very different from other um, teachers teaching science in 2019-2020. Uh, the truth of the matter is we want to scale, and we would love to scale. The problem with scaling is it is extraordinarily expensive. Um, 
when we put together our um, uh, treatment and control conditions, we you know had to use administrative data. We used a, a randomized program to do it. Then we had to go through not just looking at mean differences, but do, running a whole set of equivalences to make sure that the two were um, equal. We also drew from different parts in different socioeconomic status. So, um, in fact, the uh, intervention is having its most effect on low-income and minority students, which is what we had hoped would be the case. Getting back to the scaling question, um, what we would need, because there's one thing that's very important to remember about a randomized trial or even... um, any kind of small intervention that you do, it's not generalizable. So I can't tell you that this is, well, this effect would be generalizable to the whole United States. I can't do that. I would need a sample of schools in the United States and then have to do um, a control treatment condition. Now think about how difficult that is. So um, to be able to do that and to have a power estimate that would be strong enough to withhold basically a larger sample of schools in the treatment and control condition requires an enormous amount of kids that you're taking through the treatment and the control condition. And those are consent forms. Those are IRB procedures. Those are materials. Those are observations. Those are an analytic team. So I don't want anybody out there to think that this is not extraordinarily expensive And it's very difficult. Um, On the other hand, why wouldn't we do this? When Salk came up with a polio vaccine, and we know that this is really having an effect, how can we withhold this from children? And we're also doing this at the third grade, and we have the same kind of extraordinary effects at the third grade. People want to do science. They don't want to be taught memorization. They don't want to do plug and chug um, equations. They really want to be engaged. They Once they're engaged and they're actually doing it, it really makes a difference. So my um, feeling here is it's worth it, and we're in the process of right now looking for funders and trying to help us figure out how we're going to scale because of the fact that it's so expensive. Thank you, Barbara. Um, to answer your question about uh, nudging Stefan and what would be a, a better word, um, I guess the first thing I would say is that um, nudging is a really appealing idea, um, and we, we definitely um, fell uh, for it in the early days of, of the EF. Um, we, we produced a, um, an online tool called the Teaching and Learning Toolkit, um, which summarizes the evidence on lots of different um, interventions in, in quite an accessible way. Um, and uh, we think about 70% of, of, of senior leaders in, in English schools have used that tool. Um, and it's really easy to sort of fall for the trap of thinking, well, 70% is a high number, we're, we're doing a great job, that's going to change lots of practice. Um, and I think um, the sort of this, the, the creeping realization that, that fills you with a kind of coldness initially is, is actually that's not true. Um, and you need much, much deeper level of engagement if you're going to, to change practice and, and actually support improvement. Um, so I think uh, a phrase that we quite like that I think sort of acknowledges that challenge is a phrase like disciplined innovation. Um, I think what that, that implies is that actually um, quite a lot of effort has to go in. Um, you're not sort of messing around. Um, you're not just trying things out um, on a whim. Um, when you're innovating, when you're trying to improve, um, you've actually got an obligation to, to look at what others have tried first. You've got an obligation to um, put the effort into the evaluation to work out whether your nice idea actually um, is an idea that leads to improvement. And then I guess the the point that I'm I'm adding is you've got an obligation to um, put the effort into um, providing the support and the tools needed if you want um, to to scale that up. Although I guess scale up is a a phrase that that has some baggage. So I would say to support people um, to contextualize and to use that um, for improvement. Thank you. So let me open the floor. Bill has already requested the floor. So. Uh, 
Thank you. I think most importantly, all of us who know you, Barbara, would want to say hooray and congratulations and fantastic. And uh, you must be really deservedly excited and proud. So we're, we're really thrilled for you. Um, I love the um, RCT, the step wedge design seems to be a really clever way of uh, overcoming some educators' objections to the use of that approach. And my question is around, it's kind of for both of you, but it's, it's, it is for both of you. In the very end of your loop, you use the word vaccine. Uh, and that, for me, triggers a real challenge uh, because an intervention that's to take a vaccine or not to take a vaccine is very boundable. Your intervention seemed to me to have about seven different heads to it, different components from professional learning, from um, uh, embodied cognition, from coaching, from training, from 24-7 support, you know, incredible. Uh, and how do you know which of the active ingredients are absolutely essential in an intervention like that? And I guess uh, for Robbie, you know, what are, the, what are the robust ways of getting better at shining a light on understanding the active ingredient question, if that makes sense? Mm -hmm. First of all, I want to thank you for uh, scolding me on the use of medicine because um, too often we think, no, you're right. You're too often, and, it, and I just do it by practice, and it's the wrong, um, certainly the wrong metaphor. So, um, and, the, and it's just too easy. And, and this is, we did not test one of those things. We tested a system. And therefore, when we scale, and we, st and we started by having a system. So for us, it's basically called a system. We, do, we are not looking. We can, of course, do exploratory work where we can understand the contribution of each of these things. And we're going to look for more effective teachers. Um, in fact, last night I talked to one of my students because um, we started... What, what you call the heterogeneity effects. So these are basically the differences that would um, raise the counterfactual for your um, uh, main effect. And we're in, we're in the process of doing that in a sensitivity analysis of how many actual kids you'd have to move out of the um, design to be able to replicate the design effect. So um, we are, know that these classrooms could very much be um, an issue that relates to selection. So we're testing all of those things. But I, I want to be real clear. We deliberately designed a system. We did not want it to be looked at as project-based learning. Because if it's looked at as project-based learning, it misses what project-based learning is. And we just didn't do it that way. Thank you, Barbara. Thank, thanks, Bill, for the question. Um, I think my simplest answer is that we think the R RCT is an incredibly valuable tool, and I think we've helped um, demonstrate that it's a tool that can be used um, in a range of circumstances. Um, but we absolutely don't think it is the only tool. And actually, I think the RCT lobby, if I count myself as part of that, um, does itself no favors um, by implying that it's the only way. Um, in fact, I think... Um, that is a really bad move for advocates of RCTs. Um, so RCTs are good ways to get um, or to reduce the chances of um, bias um, in an impact estimate, um, but they are not a replacement for uh, a high-quality um, process evaluation, and they probably shouldn't be used until you've um, done quite a lot of theoretical work to work out why your intervention looks like it looks. Um, so I think Stefan and his team have taken exactly the right approach in um, trying to develop uh, measures and, and an intervention, and, and now um, it's really um, promising, exciting, I think, to hear um, them considering uh, doing some, some experimental research in, in the next step. Um, but skipping right to that step would have been a, a, a waste of time and money. Up. Um, <laughs> Wait for the mic. Wait for the Thank you, Barbara and Robbie. Actually, great system or great project. Um, and I'm not surprised to hear the positive effects of both of, for both of you. Um, oh, we have a study. You talked about third grade students. We have a study, hard uh, data. We collected data about scientific curiosity of kindergarten children. 
and uh, they are very curious in terms of science and so on. So I'm not surprised about the third grade. And I would like to ask both of you, uh, did you try to look at the transfer effects of the system or the metacognition? And did you try to also to explore to what extent the effects remain after you are going out of the school uh, next year or two years from whenever you try to implement your, I don't know if you said system, but uh, the intervention? Um, so the um, I am not the, I'm the co PI on the third grade, um, and my colleague Joseph Krychek and actually his name should have been on my slide because we do everything together. That's called multiple literacies, and the reality is that um, the rating scores also improved for the treatment group, so that we weren't surprised because um, we did expect some of that to happen just because of the emphasis that happened in the third grade. Um, we could um, test because we've been given administrative um, data from both the state of Michigan and California to look and see if um, the treated kids had a different effect on their math scores than the kids that were in the control group because we'd be able to do that. So those are things that we've actually um, thought about for papers for our graduate students in the future. Um, it isn't c quite where we are right now. Um, the questions of heterogeneity and sensitivity really come first. The last thing on the question of sustainability, when we did the field test um, and when we talked to our teachers at the end of 2018-19, um, they all said they could never go back to teaching science the way that they used to teach it. And that's both for the third grade and for the high school teachers. Now, I come on, I, I'm, I'm not foolish. Of course, it's what you'd like to hear and when people participate in your studies and you've paid them for participating and all these other things, of course, what are they gonna say? Oh, we hate you, we don't like you, we're never gonna do this again. Um, but on the other hand, I do think that they're, um, Will, you know, will the halo glow away? Probably. I hope not. Um, and that's why we decided very much to look at these treatment teachers the second year. We, um, Joe and I both have endowments. We took the money from our endowments to basically go and follow the treatment teachers in both the, uh, in the high school study. Um, the Lucas Foundation gave us the money for the third grade because they understood it in a much different way. We didn't have the money for the high school students. But we felt that um, in order to make any kind of a statement about sustainability, we had to do something longitudinal. No, I, I, go ahead. So Sharon and Carlos? And that will be the two last ones. <laughs> Um, it's probably a question more for Robbie than Barbara because I've got a clear view from the description that you were designing a system and it's very clear about how that system all comes together, Barbara. I suppose, Robbie, my question is, and it always interests me, and I spent 10 years in health, so I'm quite happy with your vaccine um, analogy, but what I actually notice in education is that when schools decide to... Um, deliver a program or a system or something that they've said that everyone has said is giving fantastic results the capacity to deliver it with efficacy to actually achieve the same results um, is a real issue in my mind because it doesn't take too long before parts slip out of what they're delivering oh we'll just miss that step we don't need that bit really we haven't got enough time the teachers have changed over and soon we haven't got anything like what we started with so my question is when you're deciding to fund particular randomized control trials how much consideration is given to the practicalities of that in a scaled up model in the long term um, in your decision making about what is worth actually investigating and in what way? Uh, 
Thank you. Um, another one for Robbie. I, I really like this um, uh, this idea of discipline innovation. If and if I understand correctly, you're referring to the second uh, that you broke you broke down the, the 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 big question into two, and you're referring to the second phase where we've already generated the evidence, and now it's about you know, how we nudge it or how we how we uh, move forward. So, and and the question would be. Um, in the in the experience of the uh, EF, uh, the schools you've worked with for the trial, say for the generating the evidence phase, and the schools that are willing to engage in this uh, discipline innovation process, are they any different? Is there a different profile of schools? So, and I'm thinking because if we move this project forward, uh, who are the you know the kind of schools and people we have to target to, to be more uh, effective in a discipline innovation uh, uh, with that kind of approach. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll try and combine my answers to the two questions because we're at the end of the day. Um, the, 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 the first um, is, about, um, is about scale and how do you support schools to implement things um, with fidelity, as I understand it, and to implement them with the, the kind of parts that are um, effective and um, I guess I'm also conscious that even some of this language of implementation is quite clinical um, and um, can can miss the importance of contextualization. Um, one of the things, the simplest way that we do it is we draw a distinction between an efficacy trial and an effectiveness trial. Um, and uh, at the efficacy level, um, we're testing something and, and giving it what we think are the best chances of of success. Um, so we'll involve the developer um, of the approach often. Um, we'll be very uh, hands-on in terms of um, the amount of training that's provided. Um, and we'll acknowledge that um, we are trying to give this idea the best chance of success. So that might be 40 schools, for example, taking part. Um, then we will go to the next step and we'll go to an effectiveness trial and that will be a, a larger um, trial and the developer of the intervention will, will need to step back. Um, and we find that, that that step is a really a humbling one because it does show you that there are um, many, many things that, um, or many more things that work um, when everybody is focused on it and they are incredibly hands-on um, than at the next step. Um, and so um, that has led us um, at an aggregated level to start to think about the ingredients that um, might make it possible for something to go from efficacy to effectiveness. And that might be to do with the simplicity of the approach, for example. Um, it might be uh, to do um, with the amount of examples and contextualization resources and support um, that, that exist. Um, I think the other sort of challenge with the efficacy to effectiveness step um, is that the kind of schools you get involved at the early stages, the early adopters, if you like, are different um, in many cases um, from the kind of schools you get to next. Um, and actually this, this nudging again comes up again. Um, and we found um, that actually we need to be much, much more proactive in trying to, to take evidence um, to some areas of the country and some types of schools in the country than... Um, than the sort of easier conversations we had in the first two or three years where the, the keenest came to us and said, we want to, 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 to partner with you and to, to draw this down. Um, and that, then it becomes really difficult. And maybe if we have this conference in, in five years' time, we can come back and give you an update. But then you get to that challenge because um, we think it's essential that this is um, about evidence as a professional tool that you use Pull, pull and that people are attracted and want to work with you rather than that you are you're pushing down evidence onto them because an intervention in a school is not a pill um, people need to, to want to make it work um, but how do you how do you balance that tension with the idea that the people who are at the front of the queue are maybe not the people that you wanted to see at the front of the queue um, so how can you be more supportive about getting evidence to the types of communities and the types of schools serving uh, high levels um, of, of disadvantage in communities um, Without without changing your your strategy and without becoming top down and and if I'm honest I think we don't have an answer to that um, and 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 that's uh, that's our research agenda now. Uh, um, Stefan asked if I wanted to say one thing in about this and I I would like to say two things actually, <laughs> forgive me. The first is that when Robbie talks, if I were sitting here next to um, the head of the Institute for Education Sciences. He would give exactly the same definition for those um, for the field test, the efficacy trial, and the effectiveness trial. 
as they would at the National Science Foundation so that the language um, in the policy arena is consistent. That's the first point so that everyone knows. And, and also, everyone has also said that we have to um, continue with quasi-experiments. We need case studies. We need studies that um, basically go very deep so that there's everyone also is in agreement about the multi-method uh, approach. The thing that I wanted to say about the effect of because now um, if we wanted to, you know, if we keep talking about having an effectiveness trial for the chemistry and the physics unit as they are currently developed, we could very much move into that. But there's one thing, and this is really important for all the people, the 11 uh, countries that are in the OECD study now and the ones that are moving now to the next step of that, make sure you have one a very detailed description of your sample because you have to know who was in it, how you got them. So be very purposeful about describing every, every either unit, if it's a school or people, you've got to be able to say that. Second, you have to have a technical report because OECD can't, there are too many things that you leave out that they don't know that it, you have to be so clear about how you did your measures, where they come from, what is the background for those measures, what citations are you using, what was your model, what was your, you have to have an action model and you also should have a logic model. You have to be able to say how did you train your people to go and get your data. And then when it came back, how did you code it and what did you do with it? And I, I'm really like pressing this point so much because if, as a developer, if we go to an effectiveness trial, we start at the very beginning. So our data files, everything that we will hand over to somebody who's going to do this independently of us has to be every single one of those decisions every one of those definitions, everything has to be in order to make that happen. And when you archive your data, so I've had other studies where I've archived my data, they reanalyze your data for you and they look for what's missing and, did you, and then they call you when you have to go back to your data files and make sure that that data is there. And I'm really, because to those of us in the room, I mean, basically we're talking to people that are developers, not people, you know, we don't have the independent people here that, like, run the great big trials, but we're the ones that have the, that burden and responsibility, a real responsibility to, if we want, if we're serious about taking our work to the next level, we, no matter what kind of study you're doing, you've got to do this grunt work where you describe every single thing that you did in your study. Thank you very much to both of you. So please join me in thanking Ruby and Barbara.